The story kicks off with a rather dramatic scene. We see a young lady seated in a car, her head spinning from an unknown cause. The driver, his eyebrows raised, notices her unusual behavior, suggesting that she might have indulged in a bit too much to drink. In response, she mumbles something about feeling dizzy. Her thoughts whirl inside her head as she battles to stay awake, but her eyelids betray her, drooping gradually. She finally gives in, slumping against the car's interior, and this doesn't escape the driver's attention. He smirks, sensing an opportunity. With a sudden, ear-piercing screech, the car grinds to a halt, surrounded by the eerie desolation of an abandoned area. Another figure materializes, joining the driver, and they seem to have sinister intentions toward the unconscious girl. Suddenly, she blinks her eyes open, her voice shaky as she questions their actions. The new arrival reassures her that they are just about to wake her up, wearing a sly smile. The driver, his tone laced with menace, advises her to stay still, promising to give her a good time. She, however, sternly warns them to reconsider their choices. They mock her, suggesting that girls like her tend to scream the loudest. But just as the man starts to unzip his pants, she strikes with her foot, knocking him to the ground. As she opens her eyes, she coolly remarks that she did try to warn them. In that very moment, the flashing lights of police cars pierce through the darkness, and the police arrive on the scene. A frantic lieutenant calls out her name, rushing to her side, horrified by the bloodstains on her body. He sighs deeply, seemingly familiar with her penchant for getting into such situations. His fellow officers gather around, curious about the mysterious woman, and one of them identifies her as Sergeant Hannah Lee. She's a renowned counterterrorism agent, plucked from a special missions unit by a private military company. Her track record boasts of never failing a mission, making the bounty on her head astronomical. They also mention her twin brother's involvement in the intelligence service, adding an intriguing layer to her already legendary status. One cop wonders aloud about the sibling duo's dual roles in a private military company and intelligence service, pondering why she's in Korea and if she might join their team. Meanwhile, the lieutenant scolds Hannah, reminding her of his strict orders not to kill anyone. Unfazed, she maintains that she didn't kill anyone, though he's skeptical, given the state she left her assailants in. She explains that she was intoxicated and had to act in self-defense, albeit somewhat excessively. She hands over crucial evidence, including a burner phone used for recording and the knife wielded by the attackers. She emphasizes the recording from the crime scene, asserting that their actions amounted to attempted murder and robbery. She adds that considering the heinous acts they subjected her to, they could face charges of sexual assault and intimidation as well. Hannah stares at the lieutenant and demands his shirt, contrasting how clean it is with her own blood-soaked attire. Reluctantly, he hands over his shirt as they arrest the assailants. He expresses gratitude for her role in apprehending them, acknowledging that without her, they might have escaped justice once more. However, Hannah, ever the pragmatist, prefers cash over words as her compensation. She hints at the lieutenant's promising future, given these arrests, and he eventually agrees to treat her once he receives his next paycheck. As they head towards the police car, she pleads with him to keep her involvement in the incident a secret because no one should know. Curious, the lieutenant inquires about Hannah's brother, Do Yi. She replies that he's been on a whirlwind tour, listing off several places he's visited over the past two months. She mentions that he mentioned going to Cambodia just last week. The lieutenant remarks on her brother's quick transition to real missions following his service with the underwater demolition team. She lauds her brother's intelligence, especially in the midst of intense assignments with the overseas narcotics investigation team. Suddenly, Hannah's phone rings with a Cambodian number, and she wonders if it could be her brother. She answers, and the caller identifies themselves as a representative of the National Security and Intelligence Service. A chill runs down Hannah's spine even before she hears the caller's voice. The caller delivers the devastating news that her brother, Duyi, did not survive his last mission. The police lieutenant watches Hannah, wondering when she'll finish her phone call. He notices her anger and hears her shouting at the person on the other end. Concerned, he walks over, realizing that Hannah is really upset. She firmly believes the caller is lying and adamantly insists that there's no way something bad could have happened to her brother. Suddenly, Hannah starts choking, and she collapses to the ground, sobbing uncontrollably. The pain she feels is so overwhelming, it's like a mix of being physically hurt and blinded, and it all feels like a terrible nightmare. Back at home, Hannah recalls a memory from her childhood with her brother. He had promised to protect her from anyone who might hurt her when he grew up. She jumps up from her bed, looking at a photo of them together, and declares that her brother is the reason she returned to Korea. All of a sudden, she hears a sound and starts searching for its source. After some searching, she finds a ringing phone. Hopeful that it might be her brother, she answers the call and realizes it is indeed him. She urgently asks him where he is and what's happening. 
but the signal is so weak that she can barely hear his voice. Because the connection is so bad, she pleads with him to just give her his coordinates. He utters words that sound like a warning about someone called Rendy and the threat of being killed. Hannah insists on taking action and instructs him not to hang up but to remain silent so she can track his location. She forces herself to calm down, reminding herself that the agency said he was dead, yet he's still alive. She realizes he must have used an untraceable device to call her, meaning he's in serious trouble. She knows she needs to get to Cambodia as soon as possible, or else she might actually lose her brother. In a different scene, on the island of Sicily, Italy, a young man emerges from a pool, running his hands through his wet hair. This man is introduced as Giulio Parenti, the leader of the Sicilian Mafia, also known as the Capo. He receives news of something happening in Cambodia. When he asks who was in charge, he's told it was Niccolo and that Niccolo was shot and killed at the scene. Without hesitation, Giulio orders his men to prepare everything because they're leaving. He smirks, convinced that someone is waiting for him. In the next scene, a man named Taijun calls Hannah, his voice trembling with sorrow as he apologizes for not doing a better job protecting Duyi. Hannah, her voice stern, tells Taijun to stop crying and answer her question. She then asks him a crucial question, where is her brother's body? Taijun's response is shaky as he explains they couldn't find Duyi's body due to a bomb explosion. He speculates that Duyi might have taken something that belonged to the mafia, and they might have tried to eliminate him using a suicide bomber. Hannah wastes no time and instructs Taijun to meet her at the main exit of Phnom Penh Airport by 9.20 a.m. local time. This surprises Taijun, and he asks if she's planning to go there. Hannah's determined reply is that since they never found the body, she's going to search for her brother as if he's still alive. On the bustling streets of Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Hannah waits anxiously after arriving in the city, hoping to meet Taijun. He finally arrives and guides her to a location, revealing that he has arranged for a tuk-tuk. Taijun Choi, a member of the National Security and Intelligence Service, was Dee Lee's closest colleague. Hannah inquires about his car, but Taijun explains that he doesn't have it today because he's off duty. Suspicion creeps into Hannah's mind as she questions why he stopped by his office. He stammers, scratching his neck, and mumbles something about having something urgent to handle. Anxious to get moving, he suggests they leave because the heat is becoming unbearable, but Hannah senses something amiss in his behavior. As they ride in the tuk-tuk, Hannah hands Taijun a phone, informing him that she needs the coordinates for the last place he saw her brother. Nervous and sweating, Taijun stammers as he takes the phone and mentions it was 75 kilometers north of their current location, towards Siem Reap, in an ordinary village. Taijun then voices his concern, advising Hannah not to get involved like this, as it could lead to complications if their colleagues at the intelligence service find out. However, Hannah ignores his caution and begins a barrage of questions about Duyi, his last mission, who he had been in contact with, the type of drugs he carried, the clothes and shoes he wore when the bomb went off, and even the mode of transportation he used. Hannah makes it clear that Taijun will provide all the details, or she'll show him just how complicated things can get. Taijun reluctantly agrees, declaring that this will be the last time he does something like this. They are now in Dewey's apartment, both Hannah and Taijun sifting through the contents of the fridge. Hannah's memories of the neat and orderly apartment flood back to her. The meticulously arranged drinks are just like her brother, a perfectionist in every way. But no matter how much she thinks about it, his death doesn't fit his personality at all. Taijun begins to explain their recent investigations. He and Dewey have been tracking a new drug called KA-947A with a focus on tracing its distribution by the Italian mafia. He reveals that this drug is tricky because it can easily be disguised as a medical substance, unlike most hallucinogens. But then, he mentions that he lost contact with Dewey just before they were supposed to meet at the rendezvous point for the drugs. When he finally caught up to Dewey, he demanded an explanation, only to discover that Dewey had decided to go solo. The revelation that Dewey had a connection with the mafia leaves Taijun baffled. Listening to Taijun's story, Hannah feels a twinge of doubt. She can't be entirely sure if she should trust him, especially given his earlier behavior and responses. There's a lingering suspicion that he might have already informed his superiors about her presence. For the time being, she decides to maintain a cautious distance from him and extract as much information about her brother as possible. She knows she has to be exceptionally careful now, considering that even her brother's home might have been compromised. With great deliberation, she turns on the television, cranking up the volume to its maximum setting. This is a tactic to thwart any potential eavesdropping devices that might have been planted in the apartment. Hannah observes that her brother detests disorder to the point of obsession, and whoever has been here clearly knows that. However, they haven't quite gotten all the details right, such as the alignment of the drink labels and the arrangement of clothes hangers. 
Determined to uncover any clues her brother might have left behind, Hannah goes into his room. There, she recognizes a hidden projector that he had once shown her. It cleverly masquerades as a regular lamp. As she wonders when he had set up this elaborate contraption, she finds herself facing a reluctant decision. She has to reach out to someone she had never planned on contacting again. Things are indeed getting interesting and intense. Hannah picks up her phone and dials a familiar number. The voice on the other end answers with a cheerful greeting, but she remains silent. After a brief pause, he playfully asks if she's gotten drunk and dialed the wrong number, just like she used to do with an old lover. She responds briefly, asking about his well-being, with no pleasantries exchanged. It's revealed that his name is Logan. He questions her presence in Cambodia, surprised by her sudden appearance. She, in turn, expresses suspicion, suggesting he might be an ex-lover or a stalker. Logan, with a mischievous grin, admits he's missed her and jokingly hints at his love for keeping an eye on her. Hannah eventually discloses that she needs his assistance, promising to provide information about a case she's currently working on in return. She tantalizingly hints that he'll be pleased with what he sees. Logan's curiosity increases he inquires about the nature of the case, to which she responds that it involves the mafia, specifically Giulio Parenti of the Sicilian Mafia. Without hesitation, Logan accepts her request and assures her he'll join her soon, asking if there's anything else she needs. She requests her old stock of weapons. In the next scene, we're introduced to Valentine's Day, a private military company specializing in high-risk missions. However, there's nothing romantic about their approach. When Valentine's Day targets their enemies, it only means one thing, death. Now, in the Valentine's Day safe house in Cambodia, Hannah screeches to a stop on her bike. Her former colleague rushes to greet her with a tight hug, inquiring if her arrival signifies her return to their ranks. She dismisses the idea, explaining that she simply requires assistance and inquires about Logan. Her colleague, visibly disappointed, informs her that Logan is at the office and speculates about his sudden appearance. Logan Valentine, the head of Valentine's Day, emerges. Hannah presents a recording obtained from her brother's room, revealing high-profile criminals, the FBI, the CIA, and the Mafia. It's clear that Giulio Parenti played a role in her twin brother's disappearance, though officially, he's declared dead during a mission. Hannah believes her brother was gathering information on the Russian and Italian mobs. Logan questions her certainty regarding Parenti's involvement. He finds Parenti's alleged actions unusual, as he's known for having people killed rather than kidnapped due to his dislike of wasting time. During their investigation, Hannah reveals that Smith and Petrov have developed close ties to Parenti since a terrorist attack in Chicago a year ago. As they study the projector footage, Logan recognizes a client named Mr. Kong. When questioned about Mr. Kong, Logan hints that he's a client with confidential details. They deduce that Mujin Kong is a rising tycoon, and Parenti would not typically engage in petty drug deals. If the information was fabricated, someone might have impersonated Parenti. Logan suggests that this deceit is common among drug dealers but wonders why Hannah's country's intelligence service didn't consider it initially. He suggests it may have been intentional. A man enters, apologizing for the interruption and referring to the intelligence they received that morning. He reveals that Giulio Parenti's goods were stolen by Mesa, a Cambodian criminal organization. Hannah, intrigued in questioning the man's identity, is introduced to him as Yunsong Yu. Curiosity piqued, Hannah gently shakes Yunsong and earns a warm smile in response. He reveals his Korean descent and willingly offers to assist her during her stay in Cambodia, finding pleasure in encountering a fellow Korean in this foreign land. Back at the house, Taijun anxiously searches for Hannah, worried about her safety. Just as his concern peaks, she suddenly walks in, and he immediately scolds her for going out alone, emphasizing the dangers of the area. They enter the house, where she grabs a bottle of water, drinks it hastily, and slams the empty bottle onto the table. Concerned for her well-being, Taijun suggests accompanying her if she needs to go anywhere, fearing for her safety if she continues to wander alone. Hannah then leans against the table, her demeanor tense, and admits there's much she doesn't understand about her brother's case and about Taijun himself, despite their long acquaintance. With determination in her eyes, she pulls out a gun, cocks it, and points it at Taijun, urging him to make the right choice. She questions the information he provided, noting significant gaps, especially in the surveillance video. She inquires about Dewey's unusual behavior in the dashcam footage, highlighting how he entered the building where the mobsters were and was later dragged out before the bomb detonated. She raises doubts about why the perpetrators would showcase her brother's face on camera if their intent was to kill him, suggesting that it might have been staged. She further reveals that the intelligence service declared Dewey dead based solely on the video, which isn't even the original version but rather an edited one. Hannah turns her attention back to Taijun, her gaze unwavering, 
and demands to know if he has an explanation. Taijin stammers as he admits that they found a body with a damaged suicide vest, making it impossible to conduct an autopsy. He explains that they identified the body as her brother's due to the presence of his dog tag. Keeping the gun trained on Taijun, Hannah declares that, from this moment forward, he's an accomplice to the case. She instructs him to cease his investigation into her, and in return, she'll pretend to believe his lies. She then orders him to inform his superiors that she hasn't left Dui's apartment since yesterday. Taijun reluctantly agrees, and Hannah nods while signaling her partner Yun Song Yu to intervene. Yun Song swiftly incapacitates Taijun, remarking, What a heartbreaking betrayal. Hannah retorts that it's still too early to label it a betrayal and that they'll have to wait and see how the story unfolds. In the next scene, we see Hannah riding a bike, and Yun Song inquires if she's planning to leave. She reveals that Logan provided her with the coordinates to the safe house and suggested that the Cambodian crime syndicate might target it. Yun Song acknowledges the strategic importance of the location and advises her to maintain a low profile until receiving further instructions, as Parenti is likely to make a move due to items stolen from him. Determined to get ahead of their adversaries, Hannah resolves to sneak into the safe house. Yun Song expresses his interest in her romantic life, asking if she's seeing anyone. She confirms that she is, and he playfully concedes, promising to step back. He bids her farewell and wishes for her safe return. As she speeds away, Yun Song reflects to himself, finding the situation quite intriguing and lamenting, what a shame. Hannah has finally reached the Valentine's Day safe house. She takes a moment to soak in her surroundings, reflecting on the history of this place. It's a hub of preparation for some imminent operation, with weapons neatly arranged and ready for action. Her mind swirls with thoughts of what her brother has gotten her into, and she clings to the hope that he'll send her some sign of his continued existence. Her reflections are interrupted by a call from Logan, checking on her status. She reassures him that everything seems quiet on her end, almost eerily quiet. Then, a question that's been nagging at her surfaces, is Yun Song Yu really a part of Valentine's Day? She noticed he wasn't wearing their distinctive badge. To this, Logan remains silent, offering no clear answer but mentioning a challenge posed by someone named Lu. Hannah, caught off guard, asks about Lu, a name she's never heard before. Her nerves are rattled as Lu suddenly appears, prompting her to reach for her gun. With her weapon trained on him, Lu introduces himself as Edward Lu from the US Logan, still on the call reminds her of his earlier warning about Lou's presence, and she abruptly ends the call. Lou's unexpected appearance leaves Hannah puzzled, and she demands an explanation. He playfully suggests he thought she might be bored, but when she presses further, he admits to having personal business in Cambodia and a score to settle with Mesa. Mesa, he reveals, is the syndicate he's investigating, one of the drug cartels tightly gripping Cambodia. They not only stole from Parenti but also committed a murder link to the Sicilian Mafia. Hannah, bewildered by Yun Song's involvement, seeks reassurance that Lu won't interfere with her mission. He assures her that he won't be a hindrance and suggests they stick to the original plan, she takes care of Giulio Parenti while he handles Mesa. However, Hannah's suspicion lingers. She suddenly grabs Lu's shirt, insisting that he's not a Valentine's Day agent. He chuckles and clarifies that he never claimed to be an agent, he simply offered to assist her during her time in Cambodia. Just as the tension starts to simmer down, Hannah's phone rings again, this time with Logan on the line. He informs her that Mesa is on the move and will reach the designated coordinates in three hours. He paints a daunting picture, describing a convoy of 40 heavily armed individuals traveling in a trailer, two shipping containers, and six trucks. Parenti has caught wind of their movements and is pursuing them, leaving Hannah with a daunting question, can she handle this formidable challenge? About an hour later, we see Hannah plotting with Yunsong on how to carry out the operation. She mentions her plan to sneak into the trailer and target the tires of the truck in front of it. He inquires whether she intends to hold up the entire group until Giulio Parenti arrives, to which she replies with a firm negative. Hannah then proceeds to outline the steps she intends to take. Firstly, she explains that she will detonate the landmine when Mesa appears. Secondly, she would seize the opportunity to sneak into the trailer amid the ensuing chaos. Lastly, she would await Giulio Parenti's arrival. Furthermore, she expresses her intention to opt for a minimal force approach, aiming to create just enough distraction to gain access to the trailer. After her detailed explanation, Yun Song advises her to stay safe since he's starting to develop stronger feelings for her than he had anticipated. He urges her to begin her preparations. While tracking their targets, Yun Song informs her that Parenti is among them. Following a brief countdown, they executed the initial step of their plan but noticed signs of life inside the trailer. Swiftly, Hannah begins scaling the trailer's exterior to gain entry. She leaps inside and opens fire, narrowly avoiding being overpowered by one of the men, 
thanks to Yansong's timely intervention. She expresses her gratitude to him for handling that particular threat. While they await their second target, Yansong provides an update, revealing that the target is moving at high speed and a significant collision is expected. Suddenly, Hannah overhears a man talking on the phone. He seems not to desire Parenti's merchandise, expressing regret that he had ever entered into a contract. Just as she eavesdropped, a violent collision occurs causing the trailer to shake and Hannah to lose her balance. Yansong repeatedly calls her name, concerned about her well-being. Eventually, she manages to open her eyes, trembling as she removes the earpiece from her ear and readies her firearm. Just then, a man approaches the trailer's door, and Hannah aims her gun at him, issuing a stern warning. Instead of retreating, the man reaches for her weapon, pressing it against his own forehead and daring her to pull the trigger. He claims that he had been eagerly awaiting death, then in a sudden and brutal move, he strikes Hannah, causing her to lose consciousness. He then lifts her with sinister intent, stating his intention to take her with them to determine if she has any utility. In the next scene, Hannah awakens with a sudden realization that her hands are tightly bound. Panic surges through her, and she immediately starts to struggle against her restraints. The man who had picked her up notices her frantic movements and remarks, it appears you have quite the quick reflexes. She looks up, her eyes widening as she recognizes the face before her. It's none other than Giulio Parenti. With a mixture of fear and curiosity, Giulio inquires about her identity and whether she had been waiting for him inside the trailer. Hannah confirms this, but before she answers his question about why, she slyly suggests that he should remove his clothes. She adds that she can't possibly leave the bathroom in her current disordered state, given how filthy she looks. Angrily, he grasps her chin, demanding to know if she's attempting to flirt with him and questioning whether she expects to leave this place alive. Unbothered, Hannah responds, assuring him that he'll find himself in need of her assistance sooner than he thinks. In response to her daring words, Julio thrusts his fingers into her mouth, warning her that if that's what she desires, she better get accustomed to such situations. He presses his body closer, invading her personal space. Suddenly, another man barges in, demanding to know what Julio is up to and why he hasn't executed his plans to end her life yet. Julio attempts to explain, claiming that he intended to eliminate her because she had admitted to coming to end his life, but she kept making advances towards him, leading to their current situation. The other man exclaims in disbelief but quickly changes his tone when he notices Julio's piercing gaze. Meanwhile, Hannah, still uncertain about the conversation conducted mostly in Italian, senses that something unusual is unfolding. Seizing an opportune moment during their discussion, Hannah manages to discreetly cut the rope that binds her. The other man takes charge, drawing a gun from his pocket and vowing to complete the job swiftly. As he approaches Hannah, she swiftly overpowers him and wrests the gun from his grasp. She points it at him. The rope still coiled around his neck and warns Julio not to come any closer. She makes it clear that her determination brought her here to confront him, and nothing will deter her from her mission. Julio, in a gesture of surrender, raises his hands and inquires about her demands. Hannah responds, revealing that she needs his assistance to track down the imposter who has been impersonating him. She tightens the rope slightly, prompting the man to scream in pain. Julio realizes that he has no choice but to cooperate and asks her what she wants from him. Hannah's response is resolute, she wants his help, and in return, she promises to bring the imposter to justice. Meanwhile, the police arrive at the scene of the collision, and one of them approaches Yansong. He inquires about what they should do with the bodies discovered at the scene. Yansong discreetly slips some money to the officer and instructs him to take care of the bodies as he deems necessary. He adds that the individuals involved are nothing but a group of criminals, emphasizing that the police can take full credit for apprehending them. Apparently, Parendi and his gang have absconded with the weapons box and the trailer containing the cocaine. The final task on Yansong's agenda is to wipe the phone of one of the deceased individuals. As he bends down to perform this task, Taijun suddenly appears on the scene. Yansong acknowledges that he hasn't seen Taijun since Hannah gave him that thrashing. Then, he calmly produces a gun and questions Taijun about why he didn't disclose earlier that Hannah and Duyi are twins. Taijun responds by saying he didn't believe it was important information. Yun Song, while cocking the gun and aiming it, asserts that he requires information about Hannah Lee. In defense, Taijun states that Sergeant Hannah is now leading an ordinary life as a civilian, with Dee being her sole remaining family member. He explains that this is why she can't abandon him and has come all this way. However, Yun Song says that it's his decision to make. While still aiming the gun at Taijun, Yun Song instructs him to start being more useful if he wants to avoid dire consequences. As he lowers his weapon and begins to walk away, Taijun poses a question, Are you interested in Hannah? Yansong responds by saying the sergeant is indeed an enticing woman, 
which is why he's contemplating adjusting his plans. Meanwhile, back at the location where Giulio Parenti took Hannah, he queries her once more about her intentions to apprehend the individual impersonating him. He comments that it may be too late for that now, considering that the individuals from Mesa were eliminated by a sniper at the scene. Hannah expresses her frustration, lamenting that she never had the opportunity to interrogate them as she had hoped. She goes on to reveal that her brother has been tracking the imposter, and by joining forces, they can uncover the mastermind behind all of this. She discloses that there's a rumor circulating that Julio ordered a hit on a Korean intelligence service agent, coincidentally her brother. Taken aback, Julio inquires if that would mean her brother is already deceased. Hannah firmly asserts that her brother is still alive, which is precisely why she sought out Julio, to ensure he wasn't responsible for her brother's death. Inwardly, she recognizes the importance of gaining Julio's trust, understanding that her mission's success hinges on this. To prove his goodwill, Parenti swiftly unbuttons his shirt and offers it to her. He then instructs one of his associates, Romano, to fetch a glass of wine for Hannah in exchange for releasing Lorenzo. While Hannah is understandably wary of trusting them enough to consume the drink, Giulio manages to persuade her, insisting that her thirst must be quenched. Despite her parched throat, she can't shake the suspicion that they may have spiked the drink, even though she's uncertain whether it's poisoned or drugged. Nevertheless, she decides to take the risk, kicking Lorenzo aside and snatching the glass from Romano. She gazes at Giulio as she gulps down the drink. Almost immediately, dizziness overcomes her, and she staggers before collapsing to the ground. But as it turns out, they had already arranged for a doctor to attend to her. Giulio issues orders for her comprehensive medical treatment, leaving no aspect of her care to chance. In the following scene, Hannah is experiencing a terrible nightmare in which she witnesses someone making a chilling promise of revenge against her. Shortly afterward, she jerks awake, startled by the vividness of her nightmare. Confused about her surroundings, she realizes someone has tended her wounds. It dawns on her that she must have been given sleeping pills. What an awful nightmare, she exclaims, making it clear that it's a memory she'd rather erase from her mind. Reflecting on the disturbing dream, Hannah recalls her time as a Valentine's Day agent when a man ended up in prison because of her actions. During the seven months he spent behind bars, his enemies hunted down and brutally murdered every member of his family. He had hurled curses at Hannah, vowing to seek revenge. Initially, she dismissed his threats with a contemptuous snort, but as time passed, an uneasy feeling crept over her. When the situation escalated, she found herself checking on her brother daily to ensure his safety. Later, she heard that the man had been killed in some revenge scheme, and for the first time, she felt relief upon hearing about someone's death. It was a harrowing experience that shattered her sense of human dignity, a moment of disillusionment she never wished to relive. Hence, the nightmare she just endured. Determined to protect her brother at all costs, Hannah resolves to stay focused. However, her immediate concern is finding something to eat, only then can she devise a new plan to convince Parenti. As she contemplates the fate of her clothes, she rises from the bed. Reflecting on herself, she admits that she knew Parenti would be a tough adversary, but she never anticipated his level of instability. She has no clue why he's keeping her alive, as it doesn't appear he will accept her offer anytime soon. As she opens the door, she unexpectedly collides with Lorenzo, the man she had tied up earlier. She offers an apology for their prior encounter, hoping to establish some rapport with him in the hopes of extracting information about Parenti. However, Lorenzo sternly instructs her to return to her room and warns against any funny business. Hannah reassures him that she intends to be a model hostage, pleading for him to bring her something to eat, as she's famished and hasn't eaten all day. After some reluctance and contemplation, Lorenzo reveals that their food supplies are little and reluctantly allows Hannah to follow him. As he turns, he discreetly connects a microphone to Giulio, enabling him to eavesdrop on their conversation. Curious about her identity, Lorenzo questions if she might be an assassin or a North Korean spy. Hannah denies both assumptions, revealing her past as a member of the South Korean Special Forces but admitting that she's now just a baeksu, Korean slang for an unemployed person. Meanwhile, Julio, on the other end, continues to listen to their conversation while casually lighting a cigarette. As they discuss her identity, heavy rain begins to pour, and several cars arrive on the scene. Lorenzo extends a courteous offer to Hannah, inviting her to enjoy a meal with him. Looking at the appetizing array of food before her, she appears genuinely amazed and her curiosity heightens to the point where she can't resist asking whether he might have once been a chef. Lorenzo, with a smile discloses that cooking is merely a cherished hobby of his. Playfully, he threatens to withdraw the delectable food if she doesn't indulge herself. Succumbing to the temptation, Hannah admits that the food is nothing short of divine despite initially assuming Lorenzo to be a tough, gun-wielding mobster. 
Changing the topic, she inquires about a certain, say, individual mentioned earlier, noting that the name sounds distinctly Korean. Her curiosity gets the best of her as she probes whether this person might be affiliated with the mafia or perhaps be Giulio Parenti's lover. Lorenzo, savoring the conversation, informs her that Sei is a colleague of theirs and issues a word of caution, advising her never to utter that name in front of Giulio. He emphasizes the importance of not upsetting Giulio excessively. Continuing their conversation, Hannah shifts gears and asks Lorenzo if he possesses any information about her missing brother. In turn, Lorenzo poses the same question, inquiring whether she knows anything about her brother's whereabouts. Lorenzo offers a bleak perspective, suggesting that Giulio Parenti is not one to hold people hostage. As he despises the complications that accompany such endeavors, he'd rather eliminate them. Hannah, concerned, questions whether Giulio has any intention of dealing with the imposter posing as him. Lorenzo, with a sigh, conveys the overwhelming number of imposters in their world, comparing them to common street hazards. From this exchange, Hannah begins to suspect that Giulio may not be genuinely interested in pursuing the imposters, which could mean that he's putting on a show of cooperation to further his own agenda. Recognizing that the intelligence service believes her brother betrayed them, Hannah concludes that she must prolong her stay to find evidence that proves otherwise. She leans back in her chair, contemplating what schemes Giulio might be concocting. As they make their way back, Lorenzo, unable to contain his curiosity, asks Hannah if she is affiliated with the FBI. Her response leaves him somewhat regretful for asking, but she reassures him that she enjoys being probed with questions. Their casual banter is interrupted by Giulio's unexpected arrival. He playfully suggests that they appear to have grown quite close, insinuating that they might be on a romantic date. Lorenzo, quick to rebut, reminds Giulio of Hannah's earlier attempt on his life and jokes that she doesn't quite match his preference for voluptuous blondes. Hannah, in turn, asserts that Lorenzo isn't her type either. Giulio, ever observant, notices that she's still wearing his shirt and instructs her to change into something else as they are headed to a funeral. The rain continues to fall as they equip themselves with umbrellas and step outside. They are there to pay their respects to a fallen colleague whose body was recovered in Cambodia. Together, they hold flowers and bid their final farewells as they watch the hearse carry the casket. Emotions vary among the attendees, with some struggling to contain their tears and others openly grieving. In a solemn moment, Hannah recites a prayer in Korean, prompting Julio to inquire about the language. She explains that it is a customary funeral prayer, conveying the wish for the departed soul to find happiness and liberation from death. After the service concludes and the rain subsides, they sit together for a meal. Hannah can't help but dwell on her primary objective, maintaining Julio Parenti's interest. She cautiously brings up the topic of his suspicions regarding her, suggesting that he inquire about anything he wishes to know. Julio leans in, his eyes locked onto hers, and asks her to say precisely what she desires from him. Hannah, her mind racing, acknowledges that she harbors a multitude of desires and is met with Julio's request to narrow them down to three. With a playful glint in her eye, she asks for assurance that he will grant her wishes fervently. An intrigued Julio responds that it depends on the nature of her requests. She begins listing her desires, beginning with her plea for his assistance in locating her brother, Do Yi. Her second request involves tracking down those who targeted her brother, and for her third, she simply asks for her own plate of food. Julio, momentarily taken aback, inquires whether the earlier meal was insufficient for her. He then makes a decisive call, ordering the staff to leave immediately, leaving them alone to continue their conversation. Then, in a rather seductive move, Julio Parenti leans in closer to Hannah, his voice tantalizingly low and filled with a strange mix of curiosity and amusement. He confides in her, admitting that the more he thinks it over, the more absurd it becomes, the fact that he knows virtually nothing about her. He reveals that despite having a highly skilled intelligence officer at his disposal, they've been unable to dig up any information about her. It's as if she's a ghost. Then with an enigmatic grin, he cautions her, explaining that taming insolent and dangerous creatures like herself happens to be his specialty. He emphasizes this point by firmly grasping her neck, his touch sending shivers down her spine. It's a chilling reminder of just how mentally disturbed he truly is, a realization that Hannah can't ignore. Hannah, fighting back her unease, dares to ask whether he disposes of those creatures once they're tamed without any mercy. Julio's eyes narrow as he contemplates his answer, envisioning the terrible fate that awaits those who only feign submission. Now, she begins to understand the principles that guide him, but the hand around her neck continues to perplex her. In a menacing tone, he informs her that her bag was discovered near the crash site, containing a video featuring none other than Gavin Smith. They were captured on tape alongside her brother shortly before the explosion. 
With a raised eyebrow, he inquires about her connection to Gavin Smith, an inquiry that sends a wave of dread through her. As Hannah replays the events in her mind, a revelation strikes her, there was a man beside Dewey, following him with a distinct limp. Her brother was the one carrying the explosive device, leading her to believe that this limping man was an informant for their adversaries. The footage revealed that the figure tailing her brother was none other than Gavin Smith. Julio continues, shedding more light on Smith's history as one of the FBI's most elite agents and their chaotic history. He recounts how conflict with the Red Mafia plunged New York City into chaos. He adds that Smith had plotted to eliminate him before abruptly vanishing from the FBI's radar, until now, alongside Hannah's brother. Hannah's persistent questions about Smith's motives for involving her brother earn only skepticism from Julio. He reveals the extent of his paranoia, explaining that he's surrounded by enemies, even doubting divine trust. Yet somehow, her brother has become entangled with an FBI agent committed to his destruction. Julio's trust in Hannah remains fragile, and he reminds her that her brother is most likely with Smith at this very moment. Hannah pleads, insisting that the former FBI agent was protecting her brother, who was clearly in grave danger. She grabs a knife from the table, her determination clear as she slashes it across Julio's neck, just enough to make her point. She asserts that, like him, she values family above all else and will stop at nothing to protect her brother. She dismisses the rumors circulating about her brother's loyalty to the agency. Julio, unfazed by the cut, shifts his focus back to Hannah, probing her identity and intentions. He demands to know why he should trust her, a stranger, an enigmatic entity he can't quite decipher. Reluctantly, Hannah agrees to reveal her true self, confessing her name as Hannah Lee, a mercenary in the employ of an organization known as Valentine's Day. She also mentions her alias, one, fully aware that Julio might be clueless about its significance. As Hannah shares this information, Julio's intrigue deepens, a dangerous spark dancing in his eyes. He can't contain himself any longer and seizes her hand, drawing her closer for a passionate kiss that leaves her trembling. Suddenly, Hannah pulls out the knife once more and plunges it into Julio, his surprising reaction being a daring challenge for her to push it in further. In a chilling twist, he admits that he may develop a sinful fascination with her. Hannah forcefully shoves him away from her, making it abundantly clear that she's not here with any intention to kill him. In the subsequent scene, we witness her being forcefully placed in handcuffs. She lets out a weary sigh and asks if he has any plans to remove them. With an air of caution, he retorts that he's confident she possesses the skills to free herself from the handcuffs, but it's in her best interest to keep them on. While the doctor diligently continues to stitch up the knife wound she inflicted on him earlier, Julio leans in closer to Hannah informing her that revealing his plans for her if she escapes will have no purpose. She can't help but wonder why her schemes are unraveling, considering she initially thought Julio was just a run-of-the-mill mobster. She had assumed it would be a straightforward task to manipulate him into seeking revenge despite recognizing the inherent risks. However, it appears she has gravely miscalculated. Hannah's curiosity drives her to inquire about Gavin Smith's whereabouts, and Julio responds by affirming his ability to track him down if he sets his mind to it. She presses further, questioning why Smith wants Julio dead. With a casual neck scratch, Julio divulges that it's due to him having killed Smith's younger brother. Although Hannah feels an urge to react, she reminds herself not to let Julio get under her skin, he's merely testing her. Continuing her line of inquiry, she inquires about her eventual release, to which Julio states it will happen when he believes he can trust her. Until then, she will remain his hostage, and he prefers to refer to her as a prisoner, one he can dispose of at his discretion. Lost in her thoughts, she realizes she can't sit idly like this. She'll need to overpower the two guards watching over her. Assuming they're unarmed, she considers the possibility of incapacitating them. Then, perhaps, she could make a daring escape through the window. However, her contemplation is abruptly interrupted when she feels the cold touch of a gun against her head. The ominous voice behind it warns her not to entertain any escape thoughts and commands her to return to her room. The voice promises respect as long as she remains civil toward them. In another scene, Julio rummages through Hannah's belongings. His fingers brush over her driver's license, revealing her name. He remarks that he's heard of her and that she's a legendary agent. The first time he laid eyes on her, he believed she was the Grim Reaper sent to end his life. As he recalls her bloodied face and the madness in her eyes, he admits to a peculiar sense of liberation. Perhaps, deep down, he wanted her to pull the trigger. Soon after, Romano enters the office to deliver a report after conducting research. Julio instructs him to locate Logan Valentine's contact information. When asked about the reason, Julio explains that Hannah Lee used to work for Valentine. He then tells Romano that they have numerous individuals to locate and many to eliminate. 
Meanwhile, Hannah is still locked in the bedroom, struggling to comprehend why no one has come to her aid despite her frantic pleas. An entire day has passed, and she's growing increasingly concerned about the need to use the bathroom. As she contemplates her predicament, the bedroom door creaks open, and Julia walks in, a smirk on his face. He checks on her well-being and decides she seems to be doing fine. Hannah reassures him that she has no intention of running away and implores him to remove the cuffs promptly, as she's in dire need of the bathroom. Julia's gaze intensifies, and he leans in closer, his hands inching towards her, declaring that she's driving him to the brink, and then he slides his hands into her pants. A few minutes later, emerging from the bathroom, Hannah asks Julio about her pants. Her assertion is clear, he had been the one to remove them, and now he must assist her in wearing them once more. To her surprise, Julio raises an eyebrow and questions if she washed her hands. It's evident that performing such a task in handcuffs is an impossibility. However, he remains insistent that there is a simple solution. Then with a subtle and gentle touch, he helps her wash her hands from behind. Hannah finds herself struggling to fathom the peculiar circumstances they now find themselves in. He then inquires if there are any larger areas of her body that require cleansing. This bold statement, spoken in such a flirty tone, causes Hannah involuntarily flinch as she cautions him for his blatant horniness. She adamantly declares that no amount of smooth talking could coax her into any intimate encounters, as her life holds far too much value. But Julio counters, suggesting that this sentiment should be his own, given that she had attempted to stab him while they were locked in a passionate kiss. In a defensive tone, Hannah reminds him that he had been the one to strangle her, revealing the scars on her body as evidence. With tension mounting, she abruptly rises and leaves the room. In a sudden and aggressive move, Julio lunges, hurling her onto the bed. He then teases her, proposing that if she plays along, a surprise awaits her. In an instant, he reveals a phone, which caught Hannah's attention, sparking thoughts that it might contain a message from her brother. Determined to seize the phone, she attempts to snatch it from Julio's grasp, but he quickly slips it back into his pocket, advising her to maintain a cooperative attitude. Faced with this challenge, Hannah contemplates various strategies to retrieve the phone, then ultimately resorts to kissing and caressing Julio. He stands in total silence for a moment before instructing her to put on some clothing and follow him. With a casual toss, he sends the key to the handcuff sailing in her direction, informing her that they have guests awaiting them downstairs and these individuals could potentially play a pivotal role in securing her freedom. Hannah pleads with Julio, desperately asking him to grant her just a moment to glance at the phone, as she is eager to discover the contents of the text message. In response, he chides her, reminding her to appreciate the fact that he even returned her phone and teasingly questions whether she wants him to take it away again. As they go down the staircase together, she raises her concern about their current appearance, worried that if people see them like this, they might form misconceptions. Sure enough, as they encounter acquaintances on their way down, the friends playfully ask why Hannah is so closely linked to Julio, clearly misinterpreting the situation. With a wry smile, she jests that she's currently his captive, and Julio retorts that letting her roam freely would endanger his subordinates. Hannah then turns her attention to Logan, questioning the presence of all three of them in this location. He explains that Mr. Parenti contacted them the day before and expressed his concern for her well-being. Hannah, in response, boasts about putting up a fierce fight and even managing to drive a knife into Giulio Parenti's shoulder. Giulio, sensing the need for a direct conversation, wastes no time and proceeds to ask a series of pointed questions. He begins by inquiring if Hannah Lee is the agent known as One. Logan confirms that there was a time when she used that alias but assures Giulio that she is no longer affiliated with the FBI. Parenti decides to entrust the responsibility of guarding Hannah to Valentine's Day, and Yunsong volunteers for the task. However, Hannah vehemently objects, forcibly taking Julio's drink from his hand and reminding him that this is her business, and he should refrain from involving others. Undeterred, Julio attempts to take a sip from her hand but is met with a shattered cup on the floor. This incident reinforces his decision not to involve his men in guarding her, as even mobsters like them value their lives. Turning his attention to Yensong, Julio inquires about his name, confirms his hiring, and pours him a drink with a sly smirk. Then he watches as Yunsong gulps down the drink. In the next scene, Hannah feels a surge of relief as they finally remove the cuffs from her wrists and return her belongings. She recalls Julio's warning about obeying her guard to avoid landing back in handcuffs, and annoyance bubbles within her as she finds him truly exasperating. Determining to keep her composure, she decides to inspect the phone he handed her, hoping to find a message from her brother. To her bewilderment, she's greeted by a peculiar image of her brother's feet leaving her wondering if he accidentally snapped a photo of the floor. Curious as a cat, she begins to sketch the image onto a piece of paper. 
She soon realizes that the floor's design is far from ordinary. As she puzzles over the image, Yansong enters the room, peering at the phone screen alongside her. He nonchalantly suggests that it must be Mun Shipping Company. Confused by his statement, she inquires about what he just mentioned and how he could identify the company solely by the floor design. Yansong reveals that he wasn't examining the floor but rather the logo within the picture. If the photo is authentic, it implies that her brother may be trapped on a ship at this very moment, and the company in question, Mun Shipping, is under the control of a man named Mu Jin Kong. Yansong lifts Hannah's head gently, observing that she appears to have survived a perilous situation, though he admits he wasn't entirely certain she would once Giulio Parenti set eyes on her. He elaborates that individuals like her are triggers for the mafia. She appears puzzled, prompting him to provide further context. He explains that Giulio is the eldest son of the Parenti family and was previously associated with the GIS. Currently, he manages his business operations from his mansion in Sicily, exclusively dealing in legally manufactured drugs for medical purposes. He becomes notably sensitive when it comes to women with black hair, a quirk stemming from his mother and his deep-seated animosity toward the Red Mafia. Additionally, the Asian woman married to the Red Mafia's boss is Julio's former lover. Hannah, intrigued, inquires if the ex-lover's name is Sei Jang. Yunsong confirms that she bears a striking resemblance to Sei Jang. The mention of that name triggers Hannah's memory, reminding her of Lorenzo's stern warning never to utter the name in Julio's presence and the veiled threats made by the mafia. Yansong informs her that Julio has been invited to a party aboard one of Mune Shipping's luxurious yachts, speculating that the CEO of Mune will likely be in attendance. In a rush, Hannah heads to the pool area to find Julio and inquire about the invitation's authenticity. She pleads with him to take her along, revealing her belief that her brother is currently pursuing Mujin Kong. There are likely multiple motives behind her brother's pursuit, but one of them must be Kang's impersonation of Parenti. She hurriedly relays her information to Julio, but his response isn't what she hoped for. He dismisses her, advising her to return to her room, explaining that such an event isn't one she can casually attend. Desperate to change his mind, Hannah takes hold of him and declares that she knows who has been impersonating him and offers to catch the culprit for him. Julio, unmoved asserts that he's already aware of the impersonator's identity and questions whether she truly believes she possesses the knowledge he lacks. In a fit of anger, Hannah confronts Julio, questioning why he hadn't informed her that he knew the identity of the impersonator. He also asks why she should expect him to report to her. In her native Korean language, she expresses her growing anger at the fact that he had kept this information from her. She wonders aloud how long he had planned to deceive her and if it's some sort of revenge for her previous betrayal when she stabbed him. Julio, responding in Italian, suggests that she should speak English. However, she continues in Korean, challenging his authority and urging him to stop speaking Italian as well. In response, Julio tells her that she's becoming too agitated but Hannah grabs him, warning that if Larson harms her brother in any way, she'll take revenge, starting with the Italian mafia. She blames Julio Parenti for her brother's involvement in this mess. In frustration, she shoves him back into the pool, instructing him to get out of her sight. However, Julio immediately grabs her hand, causing both of them to fall into the pool together. Underwater, he caresses her and kisses her. She wonders why he continues to act this way and if he's projecting his frustrations from his previous relationship onto her. Suddenly, Julio notices her hand going limp and the ripples spreading. He quickly brings her out of the water, and she opens her eyes. She asks him why he looks so upset, and he responds that she crossed the line. She advises him to check himself into a hospital, as he seems to be confusing her with someone else. Just then, Yansong enters the scene, calling her name and kneeling to reach her. He can't believe she ran off after telling him she was going to change. When she asks if he was looking for her, he admits that he missed her. Julio suddenly wraps his hand around her and asks if she really wants to attend the party. If so, he suggests she go as his date, which would grant her the freedom to do what she needs to do. He reassures her that few people would be foolish enough to mess with his woman. Excited, Hannah asks if this means he'll accompany her to the party, and he confirms it. He also mentions that he's feeling a bit under the weather and asks for her assistance since he's doing her a favor. Surprised, Hannah inquires if Julio is feeling sick. She finds it hard to believe that he, of all people, would fall sick. Meanwhile, Yansong, noticing what is happening, gets up and leaves their presence. Julio informs her that they will be heading out tomorrow, so she should be ready. She inquires about their destination, and he replies that, if he recalls correctly, she wants to attend a party. He hopes she's not planning on going looking like that. In the next scene, we see Julio taking Hannah shopping in anticipation of the party. She points out a particular skirt and top, stating that she'll take those. 
However, selecting clothes is the easy part, all she needs is something that will hide her weapons and provide easy access to them. Julio appears behind her, whispering that she'd be better off going to the party naked. She retorts, mentioning that he's probably aware that she has a pretty banging body, so she'll look amazing in anything. She also picks up a pair of heels, and Julio rushes her to go. Despite her insistence that she's not done shopping, he tells her not to even think about wearing the stuff she just picked out. She even informs him that anything she puts on will automatically look luxurious. She then asks Julio if he'd like to have coffee, to which he agrees, but only if they have espresso. Inside the coffee shop, he tells her that he knows this seems like fun and games, but she should tell him exactly what she wants from him. Hannah notices that he's going easy on her at the moment, so she must take advantage of the opportunity because she needs him. He brings to her attention what he observed a while ago, that she doesn't seem to be scared of him. Why would I be scared of you, she asks, also inquiring if he doesn't know what an orphanage is. Her statement prompts him to ask if her parents passed away when she was young. She then reveals that she never had parents to begin with because she and her brother were born in a motel. She guesses that the woman who gave birth to them couldn't bring herself to kill them, so she just left them there and ran off. Ever since then, the most precious thing in her life has always been her twin brother. Julio comments that it's quite a contrast to his own siblings because they are always looking for a chance to slit each other's throats. Suddenly, he rises up and states that the preparations are complete, including her clothes, shoes, accessories, and all the things she'll need. He adds that everything is waiting for her back at the villa. Confused, she asks him what they have been doing this whole time, and he responds, saying he never said they were going shopping. All he asked was if she was planning to show up to the party looking a mess. She hisses and asks him why he has been following her around silently this whole time, and he says it was amusing, plus he wanted to get some fresh air. He glances at her and says it also looked like she was having fun, and then he smirks. In the next scene, we see Yensong engaged in a phone call, with the caller expressing curiosity about his current situation. As he converses with the caller, he discreetly searches through Hannah's bag, all the while recounting that the operation he initiated has unfolded into a far more complex endeavor than he initially expected. Additionally, he confides in the caller about a colleague's recklessness, specifically mentioning the daring use of Julio Parenti's name. Yunsong assures the caller of a prompt return call, as he must investigate further. Meanwhile, a question lingers in his mind, did Hannah take the flip phone with her? It had appeared that she was using it to track her brother's whereabouts. Just as he ponders this, Hannah enters the room, her inquisitive gaze falling upon him. She expresses her uncertainty pondering whether he had waited alone for her to return or if he harbored sinister intentions. In response, Yansong gently strokes her hair and reassures her that he was just patiently waiting for her and nothing more. Curiosity gets the better of him, and he inquires about her recent encounter with Julio while trying to gauge her level of interest in the mafia boss. Hannah, taken aback by his question, inquires if Julio is his intended target and if that's why he had volunteered to be her bodyguard. He attempts to downplay it by expressing concern for her well-being, emphasizing her tendency to rush into situations. He reminds her of his romantic interest in her and extends an offer of alliance, urging her to consider working alongside a fellow mercenary rather than aligning with the unsavory mobsters. Hannah, however, challenges this notion, questioning whether mercenaries are any better than the mafia when they, too, resort to violence, theft, and betrayal. Yunsung counters by asserting that at least mercenaries don't treat people as mere trophies. He denounces Julio as a dilettante and a counterfeit, predicting that once he gains control, he will discard her without hesitation. Hannah, sharing the grim reality of her brother's betrayal by his own agency and the lack of rescue efforts, holds her with her predicament. She questions who she can turn to for help and, with a hint of suspicion, mentions that Yensong's extensive knowledge unsettles her. To test his knowledge further, she asks if he can identify Mujin Kong, to which he cryptically responds that he can but demand something in return. Hannah, determined, reaches for his shoulders and offers to save his life once, warning him sternly against unauthorized snooping through her belongings. And then she underscores her lack of trust in him. Later, we see Julio and Hannah having what can be described as a tense dinner marked by an uncomfortable silence. Hannah is the one to break the ice with a daring question. She inquires if he has poisoned their meal. Julio, unbothered, challenges her to taste it and find out. Yunsong seizes the opportunity to press Julio for the reason behind their gathering sensing there must be a purpose to their presence. Finally, Julio discloses that they will soon conclude their current activities, hinting at their next destination, Macau. Upon hearing this, Hannah springs up, yelling that they are not going anywhere. She asks Julio Parenti if he has forgotten the reason why she came to Cambodia. He calms her down and continues to explain that there's a cruise ship that left Cambodia and is heading to Macau, 
which is also where the party he was invited to is taking place. Hannah sighs, saying it never occurred to her that he might have left the country. On the one hand, Giulio shares that he plans to return to Italy after he deals with things there, and he won't be coming back. So, this may well be their last dinner together. He then raises his glass and makes a toast. In the next scene, a car screeches as it makes its way to a certain destination. Hannah steps out of the car and heads towards a building. Yunsung asks her if she'll be alright on her own and if she needs him to come with her. She responds, saying she will be fine, as it should not take long. After a glance, she adds that if she's not back within 10 minutes, he should probably come and stop her, and the same goes for Lorenzo. Before leaving Cambodia, Hannah plans to take stock of everything that has happened so far. The fact that her brother Duyi has managed to hide himself so completely suggests he had someone helping him. In fact, they might have teamed up for an undercover investigation to look into something involving Julio Parenti and Mujin Kong. There's one last thing she needs to check, which is where she's at now, Taijin's house. She sneaks up on him after he has just finished taking a call. Startled, he asks her how long she has been standing there, and she, in return, asks him if he's trying to run away. He immediately reaches for his gun, but unknown to him, Hannah already has it in her possession. She asks him why he's so jumpy and acts as if he has done something wrong when she should be the one feeling guilty. She says she stabbed him in the back a few years ago, but he insists that he can't blame her for her previous actions. He says she thought her brother was still alive and suggests she puts down the gun so they can talk things out. She asks him how long he plans to keep lying to her, mentioning that her brother never had anything to do with Giulio Parenti and what he said about mobsters killing him is nonsense. He confronts her, asking how she knows that, and she says it's because she knows who the real imposter is, Mujin Kong, the CEO of Mune Shipping Company. She tells him that this is his last chance, so he should think carefully before he answers. Hannah then steps closer to him, aiming the gun at his head, stating that he was the one who betrayed Duyi. Scratching his neck, he still insists that Duyi was the one who betrayed them, and he asks Hannah why she keeps saying that he betrayed her brother. She responds, saying he still has the habit of scratching his neck when he lies. Then she says if that's what he has decided, he should hurry up and run now because the next time she shoots the gun, she is going to aim to kill. In other words, he shouldn't let her catch him again. Meanwhile, the neighbors who heard the gunshot from Taijun's apartment burst in to confirm what was going on. They make attempts to grab her while she watches Taijun run away. While Lorenzo and Yansong are still waiting for her outside, worried and contemplating if she just killed someone. Yansong and Lorenzo immediately rush in to find out what is going on, only to discover her sitting on the floor, having ended the life of the men. She tells them that they are late. Meanwhile, Julio is in the middle of a phone call. The caller informs him that he tried looking into Mujin Kong but strangely, he couldn't find any information on him. From the picture Julio received, it seems like the company is hellbent on keeping even grainy photos under wraps. It also looks like Mujin wasn't even in the line of succession until a few years ago, he only came in when his half-brother Moho Kong stepped down. The caller tells him that he noticed Julio found himself an unusual accessory, which turns out to be Valentine's Day mercenary Hannah Lee. He warns Julio to be careful, considering that Hannah put their friend Cyril in the hospital for a month and nearly slit Carlo's throat. The mafia boss assures his friend that he and Hannah are working towards the same goal now. As the caller continues to escalate the discussion, Julio ends the call. Just then, Lorenzo brings Hannah back home, screaming for the presence of a doctor, even though she says it's just a graze. Thinking to herself, she says she had her suspicions, but she couldn't leave Cambodia without confirming things for herself. She finds it hard to believe that Taijun actually betrayed her brother Duyi, and she was planning on giving him the benefit of the doubt until he ran away. Soon after, Julia walks in with a first aid box, shutting the door behind him. He reminds her that she said she needed an hour because she had somewhere to go then he asks her if coming back as a bloody mess was part of the plan. He pulls out an antibiotic to administer to her and informs her that he'll be giving her a local anesthetic next. He says that he does not want her walking around with traces of other people on her. He adds that he'll be even more upset if she comes back covered in traces of dead men. Hannah contemplates trying to entice him a little. After covering the cuts she obtained, he gets up and, in a flirty move, shoves his finger into her mouth, saying he's going to help her find her brother in Macau. And once she finds him, she should go straight back to Korea. Thinking to herself, she says that now that she knows for certain that Taijun betrayed her, the only tool she has left is Parenti, the man who is always hurting her but hates to see her get hurt. Just then, the chair creaks and as she's about to fall, she wraps her hand around him for support. This gesture leads to a rather passionate kiss. In the intensity of the moment, he hoists her to the bed, and they continue to share their kiss while thoughts of how she's going to utilize him in the future cross her mind. 
She thinks she will be taking even greater advantage of him from now on, but the only question is if he is a lifeline or a tattered rope leading to ruin. Back at Taijin's apartment, we see him rushing to his desk, hastily grabbing and shoving all of his belongings into a bag as he desperately attempts to make a swift escape. He wonders how someone could have possibly breached the seemingly top-notch security system, questioning how this intruder managed to slip inside without triggering any alarms. His ears catch the sound of approaching footsteps, causing him to swiftly reach for a concealed firearm. As the mysterious person advances, he sternly warns Taijun against any thoughts of fleeing, cautioning that it would only worsen his predicament. Taijun slowly turns, his heart pounding, and to his surprise, he recognizes the figure before him, it's Giulio Parenti. Giulio deftly retrieves a gun from his pocket, aiming it squarely at Taijun. He asserts that he's heard rumors of Taijun impersonating him. Taijun, startled, attempts to deny the accusations, but Giulio insists that all the evidence points in his direction. With beads of sweat forming on his forehead, Taijun claims to know the true culprit and pleads for the mafia boss to allow him to explain. However, Giulio abruptly interrupts, firing a warning shot aimed at Taijun's leg, attributing it to his foul mood. Meanwhile, back at the villa, Hannah awakens from her slumber and spots Yensong sitting beside her bed. She yells at him for his habit of barging in unannounced. In response, Yansong justifies his presence by expressing concern that she might experience discomfort once the anesthesia wears off. A gentle smile forms on his face as he reminds her of his role as her bodyguard, emphasizing his commitment to her safety. As he carefully assesses her injury, he inquires if this is where she was hurt. Hannah reassures him that Parenti has already attended to her medical needs, praising his proficiency. Yansong agrees, lauding Parenti's competence and noting that they didn't even require a doctor's assistance. However, their moment is interrupted as Hannah mentions her thirst, leading to a brief, awkward silence. They exchange lingering glances for a moment before Yunsong, in a hushed tone, asks if the mafia boss might have romantic feelings for Hannah. She responds with a sharp, what was that? Taken aback, Yunsong offers her some water and relays a message from Logan, who called while she was asleep. Logan informs her that Valentine's Day will provide Mu Jin Kong with a bodyguard for the upcoming party causing her to recall Logan's earlier revelation that Mu Jin Kong was the reason he was in the area in the first place. Yansong goes on to explain that all she needs to do at the event is look for a man named Oslo, and Mu Jin Kong will be standing beside him. The scene then cuts to Macau, where we see Julio and Hannah preparing for the party. Hannah sits before a mirror, and Julio enters, planting affectionate kisses on her shoulders from behind. She responds with a slight frown, accusing him of going too far. Innocently, he inquired, what did I do, before asking if she's ready. Hannah asks why she wouldn't be ready and also if they are really going to be sharing the same room because it doesn't seem like a great idea. I mean, with all the tension between them, it's definitely not a good idea. He responds by saying they are going to be sharing the same room because she's pretending to be his partner, and people are going to be watching. She pushes his hand away from her shoulder and asks him to help her zip up her dress. While he zips the dress, he kisses her back and immediately tells him that they don't have time for this, considering that they have a party to get to. Then he says he is not particularly inclined to go, but if they must, he wants her to at least be turned on so that everyone's eyes will be drawn to her. Hannah asks if all this is necessary, and Julio assures her that it is. He explains that in a game like this, the person who deludes themselves into thinking they have the upper hand always makes the first move. Startled, Hannah asks him if he means that Mu Jin Kong is going to come looking for her, and he affirms with a smile. Julio then leans forward to kiss her while she is lost in her thoughts. She says this is not an imagination, but he has become a lot more physical with her since that night as if he no longer needs to measure her up. Wondering if she should play along, she says it wouldn't be the worst course of action right now. Also, if he keeps getting excited like this, he might eventually end up letting his guard down. Suddenly, they hear a knock on the door and although Hannah seems surprised, Julio assures her that her equipment must have arrived. He receives the box from the door and tells her to open it, and on doing that, she confirms that the equipment is top-notch. In the box, there's a bracelet containing sedatives, a necklace that holds a small bomb, and even hairpins for stabbing people. She quickly tries them on and asks for his opinion on them, which he compliments on. She further asks him about the cruise ship they are supposed to go on today, she says it looks like it was docked earlier. Then, Julio reveals that it is a fake ship for display and there will be a pre-party tonight. He extends his hand to her in a gentlemanly manner, offering to help her up as they are set to be on their way. As they step out, seeing the people and fireworks all over, the party seems really big. To Hannah, she's finally in the place where her brother is, in fact, to be exact, where her brother is waiting for her. She says even if it turns out he's not in this boat, he should be on the cruise ship tomorrow. 
While they walk in, she says the party is much bigger than she was expecting, and the people are all staring at them, so she can't keep a straight face. Julio tells her that they are only looking because she looks beautiful when she is aroused. She tries to deny that she isn't aroused, and then he asks her why her ears and cheeks look so delectably flushed. While they are still talking about that, someone calls out Julio's name, saying it's been a while. Hannah recognizes the woman standing before her as none other than Sei Jang, the wife of the infamous Red Mafia mobster and Julio Parenti's former lover. This revelation leads her to deduce that the man standing beside her must be Yuri Petrov, a high-ranking member of the Red Mafia and the chief financial officer of the Petrov Corporation. As Sei exchanges pleasantries with Hannah and even affectionately refers to her as, one, Hannah can't help but wonder how this woman knows her. Her suspicions intensify when Julio, her date for the evening, pulls her closer, and she leans in to whisper, expressing her hope that Julio's motives aren't driven by a desire to appease his ex-lover. In response, Julio retorts, Is that what it looks like? In the midst of this tense reunion, Hannah's keen eyes catch sight of a man named Cyril Kuzmin, a figure she hadn't anticipated encountering in this unlikely setting. She realizes that she hasn't crossed paths with him since the time she hospitalized him several years ago and it slips her mind that he serves as Petrov's right-hand man. Say, ever the observant one, inquires if Hannah is of Korean descent and compliments her appearance. As Julio and Petrov find themselves in need of a private discussion, they politely excuse themselves from the ladies. Julio, however, instructs Hannah to remain in place until his return, a request she reluctantly obliges. Petrov, in turn, assigns Cyril the duty of guarding Say during their absence. Alone now, Hannah turns her attention to Yunsong, who had been assisting in a sweep of the ship. She queries his whereabouts, and he explains his involvement in the security sweep. Suddenly, Sei steps closer, fixing a stern gaze upon Hannah. She suggests they retreat indoors, where the air conditioning offers respite from the elements. She remarks on the inherent dangers of being outdoors, where the towering buildings provide cover for potential snipers, hinting that the party organizers may have taken such threats into account. Hannah's discomfort deepens, but Sei reassures her that Mujin Kong will not make an appearance tonight. Startled by this revelation, Hannah presses for more information, prompting Sei to caution her against placing trust in anyone, regardless of their claims. Sei goes on to reveal a surprising detail, she is the creator of the bracelet adorning Hannah's wrist. She discloses that it contains sedatives but also carries a concealed capsule with a stimulant and antidote, activated by turning the blue diamond 90 degrees. Sei confides that she never shared this secret with Julio but is entrusting it to Hannah because she likes her. Hannah finds herself charmed by Sei's mysterious behavior and ponders whether this charisma played a role in Julio's infatuation. Intrigued, Hannah queries Sei about her motivation in sharing this information. Sei's response hints at a shared past, as she sees a reflection of her former self in Hannah. She urges Hannah to trust her instincts, asserting that the Mujin Kong who might appear tonight is likely an imposter. Hannah, her curiosity piqued questions the whereabouts of the real Mujin Kong, to which Sei suggests he may be observing from the shadows, possibly even orchestrating his own demise by sending a stand-in. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted when they sense the presence of Gavin Smith. Hannah quickly instructs Sei to take a seat and call for additional guards. She directs Yunsong to move to the opposite side of the venue and block potential escape routes, providing him with a fabricated identification for their target to keep him occupied. All the waitstaff, including Smith, are adorned in black bow ties, a detail that Hannah hopes will buy her some time. As Hannah pursues Gavin Smith, he seemingly vanishes in the blink of an eye. Suddenly, an unknown assailant strikes Hannah forcefully, proclaiming that she will never comprehend just how long he has awaited this moment. Startled by the sudden turn of events, Hannah quickly questions Kuzmin, her voice trembling with fear. Don't you know that today is a day of truce, she implores. Kuzmin, his eyes filled with spite, replies coldly, My only goal is to kill you. With ruthless determination, he slams her against the wall, his grip tightening around her neck as he seeks to inflict the same torment he endured. Gasping for breath, Hannah mutters to herself, What goes around, comes around. Dizziness overtakes her as she struggles to break free. Yet, a memory suddenly resurfaces, Julia's promise to help her find her long-lost brother. In that moment, a newfound resolve takes hold of her, and she decides that this cannot be the end. Summoning every bit of strength, she jabs Kuzmin, causing him to fall back. Swiftly, she retrieves a concealed dagger and thrusts it into his hand, overpowering him. After prevailing in the fight, thoughts of Julio linger in her mind, leaving her wondering. 
Contemplating her next move, Hannah ponders whether she should continue her search for Gavin Smith. The thought that Julio might already be searching for her compels her to reconsider. Her gaze suddenly fixates on a familiar figure, Oslo. With a calculated plan in mind, she makes her way toward him. Hannah executes her scheme by accidentally colliding with a passing waiter, causing drinks to spill onto her dress. The man standing beside Oslo offers her his handkerchief in a gesture of kindness. As Oslo's eyes meet hers, immediate recognition dawns upon him. The other man inquires if she is of Korean descent and introduces himself as the ship's owner. Hannah, seizing the moment, reaches out and lightly touches his chest, suggesting that their meeting must be fate. She then explains her predicament, detailing how a stranger had suddenly approached her with unwanted advances. Pressing herself against him, she asks if he could shelter her for a while. Surprised but intrigued, he inquires about her reasons, and she shares her fabricated story, and he readily agrees, leading her away from the commotion. Expressing concern that she might be imposing on him, Hannah receives a reassuring response from the man, who admits he was growing bored of the party. He discloses the existence of a private room on the second floor. Hannah, recalling Sei's suspicions about the man's true identity, remains cautious. She senses that he could be a decoy and understands the importance of playing her cards right, as he might hold crucial connections to the real Mujin Kong. Meanwhile, Gavin Smith watches Hannah as she departs with the supposed Mujin Kong. In a private room occupied by three men, one of them seeks guidance from their boss. The boss instructs them to compile profiles of all the waiters on board and as for Hannah Lee, they decide to continue observing her, as it appears that things are about to become increasingly interesting. As Hannah quietly shadows the man into the room, Oslo leans in, cautioning her in a hushed tone that the room may not be safe. Her unwavering determination prompts her to brush off his concerns, asserting confidently that she knows precisely what she's walking into. Still, Oslo's worry lingers as he watches her proceed into the room. Within the confines of the room, the man gracefully unveils a bottle of wine and a pair of crystal glasses, extending a courteous offer to Hannah. He also offers her a robe to address the stain on her attire before it becomes permanent. Hannah's keen eyes scan the surroundings, quickly spotting a surveillance camera discreetly positioned overhead. Her intuition hints at the possibility of a concealed listening device, likely lurking somewhere nearby. The man encourages Hannah to make herself at home, emphasizing that such gestures are the least he can do for a fellow compatriot. Hannah seizes the moment to steer the conversation toward the ownership of the ship, subtly coaxing the man into revealing his name, which he reluctantly discloses as Mujin Kong. She subtly introduces a fabricated story about her sister's involvement, suggesting that her sister had come to meet her lover, a certain Mujin Kong. She artfully insinuates that her sister's lover might be a womanizer and, playfully, she admits her attraction to bad boys, all the while gently caressing the man's legs. With her covert pat-down successfully completed, Hannah confirms her suspicion, the man is unarmed, just as she anticipated. Acting swiftly, she seizes him by the collar, flipping him over as she demands his true identity, issuing a stern warning against any inclination to deceive her. She asserts that the guards present are here not to protect him but to monitor his actions. Hannah presses further, demanding to know the whereabouts of the true mastermind, causing the man to stammer and claim ignorance. The man's tale takes an unexpected turn as he recounts receiving a mysterious call from a Cambodian number. Hannah promptly commands him to dial that number immediately, convinced that the real Mujin Kong might be watching their encounter, forced out of hiding by her audacious actions. In a daring move, Hannah discharges her firearm, prompting the guards to burst into the room. Oslo, alarmed by the gunshot, questions Hannah about the situation, but she swiftly silences him with a gesture, engrossed in a conversation with the elusive figure on the other end of the line. She astutely observes the use of a voice modulator, dismissing any curiosity about the man's activities, focusing solely on her quest to find her missing brother, D. Her demand for answers is unequivocal, warning that failure to comply will result in consequences similar to what she just inflicted on the subdued man. 
In an unexpected turn of events, a single gunshot rings out, abruptly ending the man's involvement. The voice on the other end confirms that he does not possess Hannah's brother, but hints that he is in close proximity. He suggests that the party is coming to an end, advising Hannah not to panic and cryptically promising a future encounter before disconnecting. Hannah reflects on this threatening revelation, concluding that if the party is ending, it must mean that Julio is in grave danger. Meanwhile, Julio, elsewhere on the ship, commands his subordinates to locate Hannah and bring her to him, fueled by a growing sense of urgency and determination that could only lead to dire consequences. Oslo gently grasps Hannah's hand, urging her to slow down, but she swiftly snatches her hand away from him. She inquires about the identity of Mujin King's intended target. He attempts to explain that Mujin is currently monitoring them, prompting the need to maintain the act of a quarrel. In an effort to divert the conversation, he shifts the topic. However, her persistence leads her to ask once more, this time emphasizing the importance of a careful response, as it's his final opportunity. With reluctance, Oslo reveals that Giulio Parenti is the intended target and Hannah wonders why the person who impersonated Giulio is now seeking to end his life. Suddenly, a sniper's laser sight fixates on Oslo, but Hannah acts swiftly, saving him just in the nick of time. She warns Oslo that Mujin seems to have a vendetta against everyone near her, urging him to prioritize his own safety. Furthermore, she declares that Mujin Kong is no longer their Valentine's Day client. When Oslo inquires about her intentions, she states that she must rescue Giulio Parenti because he promised to help locate her missing brother. Determined to be agile for any potential challenges outside the room, she tears her dress to a more comfortable length. Just as she's about to depart, Giulio enters the room. Hannah commands Oslo to leave before the other agents become entangled in the situation. She also instructs Julio to depart, revealing that he is Mujin King's intended target. Julio questions her whereabouts, and she responds that she intends to search for Mujin, noting the several bloodstains on his attire. They agree to enter the room before continuing their conversation. Hannah inquires about Julio's injuries, and he asks if she believes the blood is his own, mentioning that it results from his fierce encounter with would-be assailants. He embraces her tightly, expressing relief that she is unharmed and recounting how his vision momentarily blurred upon seeing a bullet flying in their direction. Assured of her safety, Julio informs her that her brother is not on the ship and appears to have safely escaped. He attempts to pour them a drink while making a call to order the disposal of threats, ensuring his imminent arrival at the hotel. However, he suddenly feels dizzy and questions Hannah about the drink. She confirms that she doesn't drink on the job. Julio begins staggering after having the drink. He takes multiple shots at the body of the supposed Mujin Kong. Surprised, Hannah asks him what he's doing, all the while wondering what was in the drink he just had. While she's still trying to get a hold of him, Lorenzo storms in to inform them that they have to get off the ship because the FBI is swarming the place. At Yuri Petrov's hotel, Hannah and Lorenzo are providing assistance to Giulio as he appears to still be affected by the drink he had earlier. Hannah informs Lorenzo that Giulio tends to become agitated whenever someone other than themselves attempts to touch him. Lorenzo responds, asking if she isn't accustomed to this behavior by now. As they stride into the hotel, Yuri approaches them, reassuring them that this is a secure location, and no one can enter without permission. Yuri inquires whether Julio was drugged or if he somehow knocked himself out. Hannah, feeling drained, explains that she's too exhausted to go into details. She hands Yuri a phone connected to Mujin Kong and admits she doesn't know how to unlock it, but Yuri likely does. She instructs him to install a location tracker and return it to her, emphasizing the importance of duplicating the data. She sternly reminds Yuri that she's the source of this valuable information, leaving him with the impression that this is an order. As they continue past Yuri, he suggests that Hannah should make use of the items Rose provided. He goes on to reveal that the wine Julio consumed contains a new type of stimulant mixed with an unnamed aphrodisiac. Yuri explains that although the antidote capsule may cause a slight shock, Julio will quickly regain his senses. 
Intrigued, Hannah asks what would happen if they simply left Julio in his current state. Yuri warns her that it might complicate matters for her. Successfully guiding Julio to the bed, Hannah tells Lorenzo he can leave, though he questions the necessity of his departure. She convinces him by mentioning an injury to his upper right abdomen, urging him to go quickly and not cause her any worry. Lorenzo offers to send help, but Hannah insists she will manage on her own, not wanting anyone to be harmed by Julio. Lorenzo renders some helpful tips as he exits the room. Hannah contemplates how to awaken Julio. However, as she turns, she realizes he's no longer on the bed they'd placed him on, and she hears the sound of the shower. She heads to the bathroom and finds Julio drenched and fully clothed. She asks if he's finally coming to his senses, but he responds by either demanding she leave or suggesting she gets a different room. They engage in light banter for a while until Julio is suddenly overcome by pain. Hannah advises him to maintain self-control no matter what happens helps him up, and they exit the bathroom together. Just as she's about to assist him back into bed, he tilts her head and starts kissing her, the droplets of water from his drenched clothes falling to the ground. They stare at each other, and the kiss intensifies. In the process, he pulls off the hairpin from Hannah's hair and immediately pierces himself with it. Hannah, panicking, asks him what he's doing but he keeps warning her to leave because he feels that if she leaves, he won't be able to pounce on her like some kind of animal. She glares at him, saying she might end up bleeding to her end from getting caught up in his antics, but something like this would never take her life. Then she instructs him to just hold her. They proceed to the bed, and Hannah begins to have second thoughts concerning their actions. She's pondering if she should just give him the antidote, even if it puts him into shock. While she's engrossed in her thoughts, Julio grabs her neck and apologizes to her, saying that if she's starting to regret this, then it's already too late. He starts making silly comments about making every inch of her body his until she becomes intoxicated by him. On the other hand, Gavin Smith has just returned to his supposed hideout in a different outfit, making his partner question his change of outfit, considering he was dressed as a waiter at the party. He responds, saying they were questioning all the waiters on board, so he had to disguise himself as a delivery guy to get away. But his partner assures him that he made sure they'd never recognize him, no matter how closely they scrutinize the staff list. This scene reveals that the person Gavin Smith is talking to is none other than Hannah's brother, Dewey. Gavin Smith informs him that he saw a lot of faces at the party, and he thinks that there is someone Dewey knows among them. He says he thinks he saw Hannah with Giulio Parenti, and it looked like they were deeply in love with each other. The next day, Giulio has just awakened. He gently strokes Hannah's face, causing her to wake up. She inquires if he is checking to see if she is alive, and he turns away, confirming her suspicion. Hannah presses again, asking if he wondered if he had forced himself on her. With a sly smirk, she explains that last night was merely an exchange to satisfy each other's needs. However, deep within, she calculates that the more he desires her, the easier it will be for her to achieve her own goals. In response, Julio suggests that her words imply she wants the same as he does right now. She chuckles at his attempt to make a move on her and turns away, revealing that she's not in the mood at the moment. She warns him not to even think about touching her for the next two days. He laughs and agrees to her condition, planting a kiss on her. Later, they meet with Yuri Petrov, who informs Hannah, whom he refers to as one, that they've completed their examination of Mujin Kang's phone. He slides the device over to her and reveals that the most recent call was made from inside the ship they were on the previous day. This indicates that, despite the use of a stand-in, the real Mujin Kong was present at the party hosted by the Mune Shipping Company. Yuri Petrov then inquires if she managed to extract any valuable information from her phone call with him. Hannah responds, stating that Mujin Kong claimed not to have Dewey with him. While she can't be certain he was truthful, the likelihood is high. She further explains that with Gavin Smith on the move, it's evident that things weren't progressing smoothly for him. Yuri Petrov turns to Hannah and inquires about her thoughts regarding the possibility of extracting information from Logan. He suspects that Mujin Kong might be Logan's client, 
but Hannah has a closer relationship with him. Hannah responds by expressing her desire to help but mentions that Logan is resolute in protecting his client's privacy. Abruptly, Say interrupts the conversation by handing a photograph to Hannah. She claims it's a picture of the real Mujin Kong and mentions that she tried her best to enhance the image. She asks Hannah if she can recognize the person in the photo, prompting Hannah to examine it, trying to see the face. While lost in thought, she comments that the photo bears a striking resemblance to Yun Song, realizing that she hasn't seen him all morning. Hannah further remarks that Romano and Lorenzo are injured, yet Yun Song is obviously absent. Engrossed in her thoughts, Julio leans in and playfully questions why she's so deeply engaged in another man's photo, cheekily suggesting that she's already tired of him. Julio reveals that he's just received an update regarding the individual who betrayed her, sharing that the betrayer was the target of a murder attempt. This revelation surprises Hannah, and she wonders about the motive behind someone attempting to end Taijun's life. Julio hints that there's only one person capable of such an act and he promptly makes a call to determine Mu Jin Kang's current whereabouts. In another scene, a man finds himself at the center of attention, surrounded by a group of cameramen. This man is revealed to be Muho Kong, the brother of Mu Jin Kong. It becomes evident that he is about to deliver a speech addressing the public. In his speech, he emphasizes that foreign criminals have singled out an innocent citizen. Furthermore, he mourns the loss of Dewey Lee a dedicated member of the Overseas Narcotics Investigations team, who tragically lost his life in a terrorist bombing. He also reveals that Dewey Lee's colleague, Taijun Choi, is currently in a coma, fighting for his life. Muho Kong discloses that there is one more victim in this sad series of events, and that the victim is none other than his half-brother, Mujin Kong, the CEO of Mune Shipping Company. He shares the horrifying revelation that after hosting a party, Mujin Kong was brutally murdered, and his lifeless body callously tossed overboard into the sea. Visibly distressed, Muho Kong then confesses that it is time to reveal a long-kept family secret, Mujin Kong is, in fact, his half-brother. Despite a childhood marked by estrangement, they reconnected as adults. Muho Kong proceeds with the emergency broadcast, addressing the tragic demise of his brother, even as the real Mujin Kong watches the broadcast on his phone from a restaurant. Suddenly, Logan Valentine enters the restaurant and approaches Mujin Kong with a grave message. Logan expresses his intention to terminate their contract, citing the fact that Mujin Kong had targeted his agents, clear violation of the rules they operate under. In his defense, Mujin Kong strongly denies any involvement in the attack on the agents. When pressed about the identity of the culprits, he suggests that the FBI might have orchestrated the entire incident. He smirks and turns to Logan Valentine, his expression revealing his belief that he has more pressing matters to concern himself with at the moment. With a knowing grin, he shows Logan the news broadcast he was intently listening to regarding the apparent demise of Mu Jin Kong, emphasizing that Moho Kang's intricate political maneuvers have seized the public's attention. He predicts that they will soon be demanding swift justice against the criminals responsible, a list that includes the mysterious Giulio Parenti. He then leans in, his eyes searching Logan's face, and poses a thought-provoking question, who do you suppose stands to gain the most from this chaos? His query leaves Logan deeply meditating, his mind racing with the possibility that everything is playing out precisely as Mujin Kong desires. This realization strikes him as dangerous, and he acknowledges that maintaining a considerable distance from Mujin Kong is advisable. Logan turns to leave, determined to end ties with the Mune Shipping Company. As he begins to articulate his intentions, Mujin Kong interjects, moving with an air of intrigue. He entices Logan with a compelling offer, fivefold the previous compensation. Temporarily taken aback, Logan halts and turns back towards Mujin Kong. He questions what he now requires of him. With an air of calm confidence, Mujin Kong responds, Your task is simple, Logan, you must ensure the safety and well-being of Hannah Lee, and not a single hair on her head must be harmed. Following this exchange, Mujin Kong, or Yansong as he is sometimes known, returns to the refuge of his home. As he stands under the warm spray of the shower, he ponders on Hannah's behavior at the recent party. 
He says that her actions appeared to be an obvious lie, and he ponders whether her feelings for Giulio Parenti were genuine or merely a performance. In his inner monologue, he dismisses Parenti as a mere dilettante. After what seems like an absurdly long shower, he steps out and re-enters the room. To his surprise, Giulio Parenti is seated there. They share a prolonged moment of intense, wordless staring. Yansong finally breaks the silence, suggesting that Giulio may have entered the wrong room. In response, Giulio nonchalantly lights up a cigarette and delivers the unexpected news, you're fired. Yansong smirks and questions Giulio's motive behind his dismissal, insinuating that he might be worried about him potentially taking Hannah away. Tensions escalate rapidly, and in a heated exchange, both men grab each other's collars, expressing their mutual dislike. Julio sternly warns Yansong to keep his mouth shut, but he continues to annoy him further. Glowering with frustration, Julio forcefully slams Yansong to the ground. Just as he's about to strike with a punch, Hannah bursts into the scene. She questions the ongoing situation and instructs the mafia boss to lower his fist. Julio complies, releasing his grip on Yansong's clothes. Hannah demands an explanation for the conflict and its cause. Julio reveals that he's terminating Yansong as Hannah's bodyguard. She exclaims in surprise while secretly acknowledging that she can't allow him to be dismissed. If there's even a slight possibility that Yansong is the real Mu Jin Kong, they must keep him close and under surveillance. Suddenly, Yansong gets up from the ground and reminds Hannah of the warning to keep her distance from Julio Parenti. He emphasizes that finding her brother should be her top priority. Regarding the photo she previously showed him, Yansong mentions that they missed a crucial detail, a message that Dui was attempting to convey to her. Hannah reacts with a flinch and inquires if he has discovered something new. He confirms, but adds that he's just been fired, so he no longer feels obligated to share the information. Yansong extends his hand and makes a final offer, suggesting that she should join forces with him, and he'll assist in the search for her brother. He playfully mentions that now is not the time for a romantic involvement with a mobster. Annoyed, Hannah questions whether he expects her to beg and grovel for his help, asserting her capability to find her brother on her own. She then turns and exits the room, with Julio quickly dashing after her. She enters another room, her mind pondering the possibility that Yunsung might be right. From the very beginning, her intention has been straightforward, to use Julio. She's convinced that her plan hasn't changed. Yet, she can't help but notice that deep down, she keeps hoping for something more, even though she knows she shouldn't entertain the idea of an intimate relationship with him. Julio knocks at the door, but she strongly insists that he shouldn't come in. He pleads persistently for her to allow him entry. Just as she's about to reach for the door handle, her phone suddenly rings. Wondering if it could be her brother, she steps closer, picks up the call, and is met with Dewey's immediate concern. He inquires if she's okay and urgently requests her to leave that place. He questions what she's doing in a location like this and firmly reminds her that Giulio Parenti is entangled with the mafia. Hannah admits to her brother that she's aware that Giulio is a mobster, but she has made her choice, believing this is her best hope for finding him. With a deep breath, she finally opens the door, allowing Giulio to enter. Still, on the call with her brother, he warns her about the danger of dealing with a mafia boss, fearing for her safety, but she remains firm in her decision and inquires about his whereabouts. He tells her that he can't reveal too many specifics over the phone due to the possibility of wiretaps, so she asks for coordinates instead. After he provides them, she instructs him to stay put, promising to exact vengeance on those who have crossed him. In an emotional state, Dewey tells his sister that he misses her dearly and pleads with her not to put herself in harm's way. In response, she reassures him to wait just a little longer. Unnoticed by Hannah, Julio comes up right behind her, gently taking her hand, and expresses his intention to accompany her. Curiously, she questions why he wants to join her when she's on a mission to find her brother, with seemingly nothing in it for him. He replies that it's because Dewey is special to her and he dislikes the fact that her brother is taking up all of her attention, but he's willing to do what he can to assist. 
Hannah then reveals that there's something she needs to confess. She begins by explaining that when she worked as a Valentine's Day agent, a man she had put behind bars suffered the loss of his entire family while in prison. He had vowed to make her experience the same pain he endured and promised to take away everything dear to her. Initially, she didn't take his threats seriously, but when her brother went missing, she had a dream about the man for the first time in a long while. She explains that he's now deceased, yet she can't shake the haunting feeling that his words still linger, casting a shadow over her life. She confides that the chain of malice she set in motion may one day return to entrap her, and that's why she's scared about allowing people into her life. As these words spill from her lips, tears well up in her eyes. Julio, her trusted confidant, gently wipes her tears away and plants a reassuring kiss on her shaky lips. He offers comforting words, assuring her that these are baseless worries. In this intimate moment, he decides to open up about his own past. With a deep breath, he begins his tale, recounting that he once had a mother with raven hair and fair skin, who was involved in an illicit affair. His father, driven by love, forgave his mother for her transgressions, but his younger brother Flavio could not accept the situation. Tragically, Flavio met a gruesome end at the hands of his mother's lover. Julio's world shattered when he discovered his brother's lifeless body in the chapel. The ensuing madness compelled him to seek vengeance. He recounts how he brutally dismembered the murderer, sending the horrifying remains to his mother. Then, in a chilling admission, he admits to inflicting a death on her more agonizing than his brother's fate. With gloomy eyes, he tells Hannah that this is the kind of man he is, devoid of mercy, and commits crimes without remorse, even when his own family members are the targets of his wrath. He asks her if his revelation makes her despise him now. In response, she gently inquires if he remembers their first meeting inside the trailer, where he appeared as a man who would willingly embrace death when it came for him. She emphasizes that she neither despises nor fears him. Instead, she feels a deeper understanding of him, ending in a passionate kiss. Inwardly, Hannah acknowledges that any form of assurance is a fleeting luxury. She makes a bittersweet resolve, knowing that once she finds her brother, she'll have to leave within two days. For now, though, their shared moment of intimacy is enough to sustain her. Meanwhile, at Dewey's hideout, Gavin Smith expresses his concern about the escalating situation. He tells Dewey that things have gone out of control, and he can hardly believe that Hannah and Julio are in a relationship. In his sister's defense, Dewey explains that the situation isn't what it appears to be. He insists that his sister sought out Julio Parenti only because Taijun Choi had provided her with false information. Dewey further reveals that he has already shared his location with his sister, intending to resolve the matter through a face-to-face -face discussion. As Gavin Smith listens to Dewey's explanation, he reflects silently, pondering the depth of Dewey's attachment to his sister. He recalls their first meeting at the site of the bombing in Cambodia and how, after persistent persuasion, they had begun working together. Their collaboration took a surprising turn when they received shocking news. The notorious troublemaker, Mu Jin Kong, had extended invitations to all the criminals he had previously impersonated, inviting them to a lavish boat party. To their surprise, this gathering had turned into a scene of total chaos, resulting in the demise of many prominent criminals. Gavin Smith ponders over the fact that he never anticipated having to pick up a firearm to protect Julio Parenti. Just as Gavin is lost in his thoughts, his phone suddenly rings. The caller delivers unsettling news, informing him that a complication has arisen. They instruct him to click on the link they've just sent, heightening the tension and uncertainty of the situation. When he and Dewey opened the link, they saw the broadcast that Moho Kong put out insinuating that Mu Jin Kong is dead. The caller informs them that it's all fake news, but they've managed to sway public opinion, and that's not all. The person also says Dewey Lee is wanted for drug trafficking and attempted murder. The FBI and CIA have issued arrest warrants, too. There's also someone who has figured out that Gavin Smith is working with Dewey Lee, the person is Motvi Sergei, and he's on their tail. The caller advises him to run away, 
and immediately, he grabs his things and runs to start the car while telling Dewey to pack his things too. Dewey reminds him that his sister is on her way there already, so Gavin Smith tells him to call her. He even offers Dewey the phone he used while working undercover in New York, even though he vowed never to switch it on again after betraying Giulio Parenti. They finally leave the place and get going, while he says he'll give the mafia boss a call. Meanwhile, Mujin Kong and Logan Valentine are both in the car, and Logan asks him the cause of the clash with Giulio Parenti. He responds, saying that it seems his attempt to get closer to Hannah Lee didn't sit right with Giulio. Inwardly, he says it might be for the best, considering the substantial risks involved in taking matters into his own hands. Getting fired is the preferable outcome. Just then, Logan gets a notification, and he informs Mujin Kong that the FBI is on the move and advises him to leave this place for now. Coincidentally, Mujin Kong notices the car Dewey and Gavin Smith are in, and Logan immediately recognizes once brother, Dewey. Mujin Kong quickly orders his driver to follow their car and not let it slip away. In a mischievous manner, he says they are going to capture Hannah's brother alive, so he takes out his gun and begins shooting at their car. In a tense phone call, Julio finds himself in conversation with Yuri Petrov, urgently sharing alarming news that the FBI is mobilizing, and the source of this information is Gavin Smith. He emphasizes that Gavin Smith has advised them to evacuate Hong Kong as swiftly as possible. Yuri Petrov confirms this critical information and recommends that they wrap up their current business and convene at Repulse Bay within a quarter hour. Julio, however, delivers a grim revelation and immediate departure isn't a possible option. Yuri Petrov swiftly deduces that this complication is linked to one. He suggests that Julio employs the drugs at his disposal to render her unconscious, cautioning him against revealing any concerns about being out of stock or potential side effects. Julio remains silent, his understanding obvious through the connection. Yuri Petrov proceeds to explain that the drugs concealed within one's bracelet contain not only a stimulant but also a minute amount of propofol, a potent sleep-inducing agent. He reassures Julio that this sedative has no side effects given its intended medical purposes. Therefore, Julio faces the choice of either extracting one while she's unconscious or lingering in their current location, awaiting capture by the FBI. The conversation abruptly ends. One of Julio's associates inquires about their course of action. Julio instructs him to coordinate an evacuation for the team, assuring them that he'll rejoin them later. He additionally directs him to procure a syringe, hinting at a more covert plan yet to unfold. Meanwhile, Mujin Kong continues to shoot at Gavin Smith's car as he follows closely behind them. Puzzled, they wonder what's wrong with the car tailing them, suddenly opening fire out of nowhere. Dee leans toward Gavin and questions whether Mopi Sergei has already tracked them down. Despite their curiosity, they have no clue who their assailant is. They hastily decide to go off the narrow road, but the relentless car keeps drawing nearer and sternly fires at them. Before they know it, the two cars collide, causing Gavin Smith's vehicle to dash into a roadside guardrail. As the dust settles, Mujin Kong steps out of his car and approaches their crumpled vehicle. Observing them unconscious inside, he can't help but feel that he's achieved his goal. Simultaneously, Hannah readies herself to retrieve her brother. She confides in Julio, expressing a sense of urgency. We need to hurry. I've already interpreted the coordinates, and he's close to Stanley Bay. Julio, captivated by her presence, seizes the moment and kisses her passionately. She attempts to remind him of the timing, but he persists. In a hushed, calculated move, he retrieves a syringe and discreetly plunges it into her neck. Startled, Hannah swats the syringe from his hand and demands to know his intentions. However, before she comprehends the situation, drowsiness overtakes her, and all she can hear is Julio's apologies before she slumps into his arms. Back at the chaotic scene of the car crash, Mujin Kong forcefully swings open the car door. Dewey, regaining consciousness, inquires about his identity. In response, Mujin Kong points a gun at Dewey's chin and cryptically mentions his special relationship with his sister. 
Surprised, Di asks Mujin Kong how he knows his sister, to which he responds confidently, there's a lot more I know than you might think. He graciously thanks Dewey for sharing the photo earlier, acknowledging his exceptional job concealing the message. He explains that red oak is an unusual choice for shipbuilding due to its vulnerability to water damage. By sharing the photo of the floor, his intention was to convey that he was aboard an anchored ship. Unfortunately, his sister didn't pick up on the message. Gasping in disbelief, Dee curses under his breath and demands to know what Mujin Kong wants. He then slumps, overwhelmed by the situation. Mujin Kong, maintaining his calm behavior, tells Dewey that he can't afford for him to lose consciousness just yet, as they haven't even started their conversation. Just then, Gavin Smith coughs and begins to stare. He is almost certain this is the real Mujin Kong, but Mujin Kong appears surprised and asks if they've met before. Gavin Smith, visibly agitated, questions Mujin Kang's audacity in following them to this remote location. In response, Mujin Kong remarks, you certainly have a lot to say for someone whose life hangs in the balance. He then points the gun towards Gavin Smith and pulls the trigger. A single shot rings out. Logan rushes out, rebuking Mujin Kong for going too far this time. Mujin Kong nonchalantly replies that he was merely giving them a little scare. Logan hurries to examine the situation and informs his client that he recognizes the person in the car as once brother. Before he can finish his statement, a gun is pointed at his head. Mujin Kong coolly asks Logan if he has forgotten who his client is, warning him not to test his patience. He orders Logan to clean up the scene and put Dewey and Gavin in their car. As he turns to leave, he casually remarks that it's time for him to embrace his role as a true villain. On a ship, Hannah springs up from the bed, yelling her brother's name. Suddenly, the realization hits her, the environment resembles that of Yuri Petrov's cruise ship. In a series of thoughts, she quickly recalls Julio and wonders why he prevented her from seeing her brother and why he made all those promises of assistance. Filled with a surge of rage, she strides out of the room and bursts into a meeting in progress. She cautiously asks if her entrance is interrupting some sort of crucial operations meeting. Julio, who is in the meeting, rises and inquires about how she's feeling. Hannah can't help but find it ironic that he's asking this question given that it was he who forcefully pressed a syringe into her neck. Suppressing her frustration, she directly asks him where her brother is. The room falls into an uncomfortable silence, and Julio finally admits that her brother is probably no longer at the coordinates he provided. Julio himself had no other choice, because the FBI was on the verge of launching a search operation. Hannah, overwhelmed with a mix of anger and disappointment, yanks Julio's shirt, reminding him that he promised to help her find her brother and that she had trusted him. He just keeps staring at her without uttering a word. After a tense moment, she releases his shirt and declares that she's leaving, determined to find her brother even if it means swimming through the open sea. Julio tries to call her back as she walks away, but his plea falls on deaf ears. As Hannah continues to walk out of the ship, tears streaming down her face, Julio reaches for her hand. However, she swiftly swats his hand away, accusing him of being a hypocrite. Her tears persist, and she questions his actions. Just then, her phone suddenly rings, and she hurriedly answers, desperately hoping to hear from her brother. But it's not her brother on the other end, the caller introduces himself as Mujin Kong. In a trembling voice, Hannah inquires about her brother's whereabouts, and Mujin Kong, in a remorseful tone, Explains that things got a little physical, but reassures her that her brother is still alive. He candidly admits that he had intended to assassinate her brother, but was struck by the uncanny resemblance between him and Hannah, hinting that she should know who he really is by now. Mujin Kong reveals that he has identified her location through the call, and as soon as they hang up, he will be providing her coordinates to the FBI. He asks her what she thinks will happen to the dilettante standing beside her cautioning her not to get entangled in his affairs. He extends an invitation for her to join him where her brother is. While still on the call with him, Hannah mentally pieces together the puzzle of his true identity and realizes that it's Yun Sung Yu speaking. 
He chuckles, acknowledging that he expected her to swiftly connect the dots. Enraged, she threatens that the next time they meet, she'll hold a gun to his neck and make him regret his existence. She slips her phone away and questions Julio if he has any knowledge of this. In response, he embraces her and offers his apologies. Hannah repeats her concerns about her brother's fate, prompting Julio to reassure her, mentioning that he has already paid the price to ensure her brother's safety. When she inquires to whom he paid this price, Julio calmly replies, to death. He assures her that Valentine's Day will be keeping a close watch on Mu Jin Kong, but Hannah remains skeptical, noting that Mu Jin Kong is a client of Logan's. Julio asserts that a mercenary's loyalty ultimately goes to the one who can offer the most money. Still hesitant, Hannah proposes a deal to Julio, she will go to the FBI and testify that he is a victim in exchange for her brother Dewey's safety. Surprisingly, Julio agrees to her terms, labeling himself as a nice villain who was exploited by her, while she's a bad villain who took advantage of him. He goes further to promise that she won't need to go to the FBI. Leaning closer, he requests a kiss, and Hannah questions what will happen if she refuses. With a mischievous smile, Julio responds that he'll have to steal one instead, planting a smooch on her cheek. Hannah reacts by yanking his shirt and telling him to act like his usual self, playfully calling him a dilettante. She presses herself against him, acknowledging that this night might be their last together. Smirking, Julio playfully reminds her that she initiated this encounter. They both return to the room, and Julio remarks on how Hannah seems to be quite enamored by his body. She affirms this, explaining it's just his body, but he's thankful that he has at least one redeeming quality. He reminds her that she's the one who asked for this, so she should be prepared, and he initiates by kissing her. As Hannah thinks to herself, she acknowledges that Julio can be annoying at times, but when he touches her so tenderly, her heart aches as if it's under a spell. Their intimate moment continues, and Julio tells her not to avoid his gaze, encouraging her to kiss him. While Hannah continues to contemplate the possibility of having to bid farewell tomorrow, she decides that if tonight happens to be their last night together, she doesn't want to dwell on anything else but holding him and never letting go. She believes she can afford herself that moment of self-indulgence, at least for now. Later that day, Julio is seen stroking and kissing Hannah's head. He says she can sleep a little longer as they still have some time, and then he leaves the room. Hannah immediately springs up, apparently she was pretending to be asleep, and it was driving her crazy. Memories from their shared intimate moment cross her mind, and she just sits on the bed, feeling drained. So, she takes out her phone and calls Logan, asserting that he has something to tell her. After a brief silence, Logan reveals that Julio Parenti requested that he rescue her brother, and he didn't intend to keep it a secret from her. She asks how her brother is faring, and Logan says he's injured, but it's not too serious. He says he had no idea Mu Jin Kong was such a madman and apologizes for ignoring that fact. She then asks him if he will do her a favor if he's really sorry. She explains the situation, saying that she'll be the one leading the operation that Valentine's Day has been entrusted with. Surprised, Logan asks her if Julio knows about this decision, but it seems she intends to keep it away from him. She says the CIA is watching Julio and she doesn't want to be responsible for putting him in danger. So they come to an agreement, and it's time to discuss strategy. She asks Logan to send Oslo in, and he accepts. He also says he'll get the EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, ready, and then asks her if there's anything else she'll need. She continues to make orders for weapons and several other things. Then, her door suddenly creaks open, and Sei walks in whom she refers to as her collaborator. Upon hearing this, Logan asks Hannah if there's anyone else besides them who's assisting her. She nods in affirmation, revealing that someone from Yuri Petrov's side has promised to lend a helping hand. Say, attentive to the unfolding plan, asks Hannah if she's fully prepared, and Hannah responds with a confident nod. With their preparations in motion, Say readies a syringe for the upcoming endeavor. Still engaged in the call, Logan's curiosity gets the better of him, and he inquires about the exact nature of Hannah's current activities. 
Hannah replies promptly, informing him that she is in the process of implanting a GPS chip into her body. She explains that Mujin Kang's cunning nature brought about this approach, as a regular GPS tracker would not suffice. Though she offers reassurances of her safety, Logan can't shake off his concerns. He presses further, seeking the precise commencement time of the operation. Hannah responds that it's scheduled to start in 32 minutes, and she's confident in reaching the designated coordinates by then. She places her trust in Logan to safeguard her brother while they are apart, and with that, the call disconnects. Sei, having completed the implantation, shares crucial information with Hannah. She explains that the GPS chip will activate as soon as Hannah enters the water. Hannah expresses her gratitude and promises to repay Sei someday for her invaluable assistance. However, Sei insists that her desire to help Hannah goes beyond any need for repayment. Subsequently, Sei asks Hannah if Julia will approve of such a risky operation. Hannah replies, saying that's the reason she intends to keep it a secret. Worried, Sei expresses her concern that if Julio finds out that she played a role in all this, he might end up taking her life. However, just as she mentioned earlier, when she looks at Hannah, it feels like she's seeing a reflection of her past self. She genuinely hopes that Hannah can save her brother. Sei repeats that she'll help Hannah, but in return, she just wants to know how Hannah feels about Julio. In another scene, Hannah is seen exercising and training and then Sei approaches and asks her if she's ready. She adds that she told the guards to buy them as much time as possible, but they won't be able to stall for long. Just as she's about to set off, Hannah wishes Sei well and extends her hand for a handshake. However, the pregnant lady surprises Hannah by hugging her instead, thanking Hannah for revealing how much she cares about Julio. Suddenly, the mafia boss storms out, demanding to know what Hannah is doing there. She immediately picks up her bag and attempts to jump into the water, ordering Julio not to try following her. He pleads with her to stay so they can talk down there, but she still insists that she never meant for things to reach this point. She advises him to get as far away from there as he can while he has the chance. She tells him she won't visit him in prison, so he should return to his turf. Hannah bids farewell and jumps into the water. Julio, obviously angered, screams Lorenzo's name, instructing him to call Logan and find out what's going on. He then turns to Sei, who reassures him that Hannah was only thinking of him. Angrily, he asks if that's why she helped Hannah swim to her death. It seems like there's still a lot of drama about to unfold. But for now, this is where it ends. Please note that this is still an ongoing manhwa and we'll update as soon as more chapters are released. If you love this story, please leave a comment below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe, we have a lot more interesting recaps for you. Until next time, ciao.